In our third session together, I want to talk about what we'll call a Paul-Timothy relationship. What does that really mean? Well, I have to go back to Barnabas. Barnabas was, as you know, nicknamed the son of encouragement. And he was a farmer and, uh, from Cyprus. And when he came to know the Lord, as time passed, the Holy Spirit taught him and he felt led to sell his land in Cyprus, donate the money to the Lord's work, and become a missionary. And in that capacity, the Lord chose him for a huge ministry to disciple one-to-one -one the young man, Saul of Tarsus, who had been an enemy of the faith. You'll recall it was on the road to Damascus that Paul was converted. His name was then Saul of Tarsus. It later became Paul. But Barnabas was the one who invested in him and vouchsafed for him. In other words, he risked his reputation, basically, to disciple this young new Christian who had been an enemy of the faith. Now, Paul, a very intelligent, very intellectual, he had been standing by, you remember, with the stoning of Stephen and consented to it. So he had a huge sin load that God had to forgive him for which he did. Now, Barnabas invested his time, and notice that word time, in the life of this young man, Saul of Tarsus. He did a whole year with him in Antioch where we were first called believers. And you'll be able to look at that. Luke writes about it in Acts in the 11th chapter. So, time spent together. It's the same thing as Jesus having appointed 12 to be with him. Paul took the time to be with Timothy. And that is how the disciple making takes place. It is through a Christ-centered friendship, a relationship that goes over an extended period of time. Now, having said that, I want you to see how it works. Paul, as he grew in the faith, went to an area where Timothy lived, between near Lystria and Iconium. And y'all will recall that Timothy was part Jewish, part Gentile. And the Lord gave them a wonderful friendship. And whenever Paul writes Timothy, if you'll go back and look at it, you'll see in both epistles, he refers to him as my son. Now those words mean a great deal to many of, uh, many of us. I can recall one day when my father out on our ranch in Texas where we lived, I came up and put his arm around me. I was a teenager, and he said, My son, I will never forget the warmth and the depth of, and the emotion of that feeling. But here's another concept. My wife's uncle, Grady Wilson, who is Billy Graham's right, I'd say right-hand associate, and T.W., her other uncle, was Billy's left-hand associate. Both of those men took me on and discipled me for years. Grady Wilson for 23 years, T.W. Wilson for 14 years. Now, I wasn't either one of those men's sons, but they both related to me as if I were a son. In fact, in one humorous moment that I'll relate, I was preaching um, as the first intern for the Billy Graham Association in uh, Australia many years ago at a Presbyterian church. And it, I was on the other side of the world from North Carolina, and Grady wanted to call me thinking it was Saturday, forgetting it was Sunday uh, in Australia. So I was in the middle of my sermon when the phone rang, and he was at President Lyndon Johnson's ranch when he called me, and he picked up the president's red phone in his office, not thinking about what that meant. So they interrupted me in the middle of the sermon and said the United States of America was calling me, which really meant the president. And it wasn't Lyndon Johnson, of course, calling me at all, but it was Grady Wilson. So I stopped the sermon and went to the phone. Now listen to this. The first two words of his, out of his mouth was, my son, I'm coming to Australia next week. What can I bring you? I wasn't his physical, biological son, but I was adopted to be his son. 
just like Paul adopted Timothy and called him his son. He wasn't his son biologically, but spiritually in a relationship that was very meaningful. Now, Lois and Eunice are the ones who led him to faith. Um, we don't think that Paul uh, led him to faith. What Paul did was adopt him to equip him spiritually, just like somebody joining your church needing to be adopted by an older believer and disciple. Now, ladies are to do that with ladies. Titus chapter 2 explains that. And men do it with men. Why the two genders? Why that way? A man understands the needs of men better than anybody else. A lady understands the needs of ladies better than anybody else. And it's safer because it's a long-term relationship and there could be no temptation, no problem that would occur uh, because of that, because it just makes sense. And biblically, it's never happened any other way. So consequently, I want to be very practical in this session. Local churches need to practice life-to-life, one-to-one, friendship-based disciple-making. Just like Paul did with Timothy, just like Barnabas did with young Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul, just like Peter did, and he refers to Timothy as my son. Uh, and I'm trying to think that's in, um, let's see here. That's in 1 Peter 5.13. My son. And for Peter to say that to, to Mark, just as Paul said it to Timothy, shows that this was not just a one-off thing. It was the way the early church equipped leaders. New believers need this. They need the watch care and the love uh, that's tender. Now, our family has made its money through the years. I come from a ranching family in Texas, and my grandfather had a lot of sheep. I still run the ranch all these years later uh, through inheritance. But my grandfather had a ton of sheep and he had to watch out for coyotes, uh, for mountain lion, for eagles. They would come down and kill the little lambs. New believers need protection from cults. They need protection from the world and they need the watch care of older believers. A lady adopting a new girl that becomes a believer. An older gentleman in the congregation adopting a new young man or a new friend in Christ who comes. I remember when my father first became a believer after being an agnostic for many years, Billy Graham led him to faith at the age of 46. He joined a church. He was baptized, got in a Bible study group, but he called me uh, several times because as a new Christian he didn't have anyone to disciple him so he would go there for teaching and they were teaching of all things if you can imagine they put him in a group studying the book of Revelation oh yes as a brand new Christian nothing worse could happen to him so I would have to answer his questions and work with him by telephone and he said Billy why couldn't some man why couldn't someone in our church take me out to coffee and why couldn't we take our Bibles? Why couldn't I um, get the kind of help that I need from someone here uh, in the church? And I looked around. Our church had 2,000 members and I saw at least 20, 25 men that had walked with the Lord for years and knew the Bible well and could easily have discipled my father, but they never thought about it because it was not part of our church life. No one understood the difference between teaching and training. So great preaching can happen, just like under Spurgeon. And you'll see the churches he started in Great Britain, I went over to see it. They've gotten smaller and smaller or disappeared because disciple making was not part of what happened naturally a century and a half or longer ago. And it's dwindled. Uh, from about the third century on. So in summary, as we close this session, the point that we want to make very clearly 
is that my son represents the spirit of disciple making. It's a close personal relationship designed to give guidance to a new believer. May God richly bless your thoughts about these verses and stories. I look forward to being with you for the next session.